All right. Only thing we didn't fin finish up from last time was drawing trees. I'll just briefly go over this. Um, Got to find it. Okay, so I believe you're required to do a drawing tree for your SolidWorks final project. Yours will be pretty small, but it basically drawing trees are typically in Excel format and they are a, a way of organizing your parts for manufacture. So this is a drawing tree from a professor from a long time ago who uh, actually went to JPL. This was a multi-million dollar research project that was a deployable pedal structure um, for uh, panels on a satellite, a rather large one. Um, so it had a lot of complex components and uh, a lot of lo low CTE components, uh, glass like uh, called ZeroDur and uh, Super Invar, which are both very low coefficient of thermal expansion pieces. Anyway, there was a ton of components to this. So, a um, couple of things to notice. If you take a look here, let's uh, zoom in. Oh, the new Excel kills me. I can't find anything. View, probably, huh? So, the first thing to notice is, and we've talked about this before, I believe, is naming conventions. So... <coughs> This was called Structural Dynamics uh, and Control Lab. Structural Dynamics and Control Lab. So that was the name of their lab. 2004 was the year they were doing it. And then they had a part number. Now you can come up with any naming convention you want. But you really ought to have a naming convention for your project. Um, and especially when you get into senior projects and, and it gets bigger. The naming convention can help you organize things and help uh, keep large groups uh, on the same page. Then there was, this ha had a description and quantities, whether they were going to manufacture it or buy it, who drew it, um, the vendor, if they were going to purchase it, the cost, um, you know, delivery dates, fabrication dates, real delivery dates, etc. So uh, uh, it's, a, it's a project management tool. But you ought to have it there. Um, let's take a look at another one. Here is QB50s. This is this is the satellites that you're making, or the structures you're making. Here's their version of it. So they decided to call it QB50CU because there's multiple uh, universities working on this um, uh, project. They've got they've kind of broken it up into assemblies. So here's a here's a 5,000 assembly. Here's a 5,400 assembly. I don't know what those are, but um, that's how they're breaking it up. They've they've put also gone down to the level of putting fasteners in. So I don't really care how you organize it, but turn it in in an Excel format and make sure that all of your pieces are represented and come up with some sort of clever naming convention for your project. Um, let me show, here's the Piranha Senior Project. Here's how they kind of did their naming convention. So they did project name, which is Piranha, subsystem designation, and you can see the codes. Um, part assembly designation, and again you can see the codes. So that's kind of how they did their naming convention. You, you, yours is a much smaller project here, so you probably don't have to get this complicated, but when you get into bigger projects, you'll want something like that. Okay, questions on drawing trees? Are you going to post those examples online? I can. In fact, I might have already.
Do, 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 do. Uh, maybe I didn't. I'll put them up. I'll put them up on. I'll make it lecture 10 because that's where I first intended to put them. All right. Okay, on to the fun stuff. All right, so sometimes uh, parts have a shape that's too complex to make with simple tool paths that you've learned, profile, pocket, drill. Uh, in the old days before CNC machines, you would come up with different tooling to make these complex shapes and which we still have so for example radius cutters you can cut 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 a fillet on a piece with a radius cutter or uh, chamfer mills there uh, some of that stuff still exists now that we uh, have CNC machines you also have another option which is three axis machining so when I say complex I mean over a surface well let's pull one up So this is a senior project from last year, a very well done one. Oh, uh, what is their final full assembly 10 inch? So this was a project sponsored by Ball Aerospace and it's kind of a uh, asteroid landing type project. They wanted to characterize the um, composition of um, asteroids and I think they have one in particular that they care about and uh, so the, the way they wanted to do it was they wanted to send a, a satellite to this asteroid drop a couple of pods have one blow up and have the other one measure uh, measure the waves and based on the waves that were sent through the material they could determine the composition of the material so they had this crazy uh, it, they called it a geopod it's this aluminum ball about about basketball size it's 10 inches in diameter so if you look at this go away go away okay so I'm gonna peel this shell away so their job was to first of all package this, uh, uh, they, they were designing the guts basically of the receiving the data acquisition pod, not the, they weren't making the explosive pod. So they were assuming that there was a pod that blows up. That might have been the more fun one to make. Um, this one's more useful though. And so they had to demonstrate communication with the satellite that dropped it off. So they had to be able to telemeter data. They had to demonstrate that they could collect data and they had to demonstrate that they could run uh, for the time time involved, which means they had to power the whole thing, so and then package it within the the pod. So here's the design they came up with. It was a very successful senior project. Now what you what I want to show you is I'm gonna hide change the transparency of this guy. Hey, did it change? It's not changing. Well, you'll get you'll get the idea. The where they mounted to this sphere, it's an aluminum sphere, pretty thin. I think it was fifty thousandths or something, sheet metal basically. Where they mounted the sphere was to these little clips. They made these little clip things. So you see that? And they had to, this face had to match the shape of the sphere, so it's spherical. I'm going to open that part and I'll send it around. So that's the part. It's a little hard to see, but when you, when you see it in your hand, it'll make more sense. So when I say complex part, what I mean by that is for if you look at this plane so for every x y coordinate on this plane my z coordinate is the same so 
you could write this with a two-dimensional toolpath. Now, theoretically, it's three-dimensional because the tool comes, it moves down to a spot, and then you cut it out, right? But while it's cutting it out, it's all staying in the same Z plane. As opposed to this surface, which is slightly spherical, for every XY coordinate on here, well, not everyone, but for most of them, there is a unique Z. So when you're cutting this out, you're constantly moving your Z axis. So not only are you moving in X and Y, but you're also moving in Z all the time. Okay? That's what we're going to go ahead and call 3D. I call it surfacing. So imagine this is a surface. You can surface it. Um, that's an old master cam holdover because they call it surfacing. Solid cam, it can get, it, it doesn't call it surfacing. It calls it a 3D profile. So it can, that can get confusing. But that's that. All right. So let's go into how we would do that. Um, the first thing we need to do is get a cam part definition. I wonder if I have that already in the interest of time. Who I do? So let's go ahead and close this guy and see if this thing works at all. The uh, solid cam submissions were pretty good. I was pretty impressed. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for next year. I hope you guys don't forget everything over the summer. Because um, it'll be cool having people that know what they're doing can hit the ground running. Okay, let's see here. Is this what I want to do? Probably. Probably. Okay. So here's my cam part definition. Oh, you know what? I wanted, actually, I wanted to show you that. Because this cam part definition got goofy. Solid cam tried to tried to guess and did it the wrong way. So I wanted to show you a different way to do cam part definitions. So let's Let's go ahead and make a, a cam part definition, and I'll show you what I mean. I'll do an internal inch, and uh, let's call it something else. Uh, maybe it's not going to like that. Let's just go ahead and do this. Okay. All right, so when I go to my coordinate system, I could select maybe this top or this top, but what you'll notice is, look what it did. Now, if that's the stock you wanted to start with, okay, seems a little overkill for this piece, right? So for this piece, if you were going to make this piece, you might just square this thing up into kind of a rectangular thing here. And then you might drill these holes. I would probably drill this hole first and then machine these pockets. And then this surface would probably be my last operation. So this cam part definition I didn't really like. So it's, that's not what I wanted. So what you can do is you can force it to do other definitions by picking other options here. I think I used three points. So I think I went, hey, do this point, this point, and this point. And that kind of forces a box, I think. So let's, uh, let's try that again. I remember it was a little goofy. Uh, let's see. I want to go in the X direction because I'm going to call this the X direction. 
Oh, no, no, no. So we'll call that the origin. Then it asks for the x direction. I want to call this the x direction. It doesn't really matter. You could have done it a different way. And see how it pops that x axis in there? And then it asks for your y direction. I'll put this point in. Pops that y in there. The z is kind of upside down. So I can flip that around later. But let's see if this does what we want to do here. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I must be in some sort of, uh, it must, the original part must have been in a metric uh, configuration because 250 is pretty big. And this 3.937, you should be recognizing that nowadays. That's uh, a millimeter equivalent in inches. So that's uh, what, that's like 100 millimeters, so a meter or a uh, 10 centimeters, something like that. All right, anyway. Thanks a lot, SolidWorks. Come on, SolidWorks. It's Tuesday. It's not even Monday. All right, let's let's give that another try. Define using this 3D or three point feature. you don't crash thank you all right now I believe I want my Z to go the other way let's see if I can edit it not letting me flip around X, Y, or Z. So I forgot how I did that. Let's try define. Oh, here we go. And then we can pick the origin. And then I want to flip around X, it looks like. There we go. There we go. I'm not going to worry about all that metric jazz for now. And you can see my coordinate system. I also could have put it up top. Um, which I probably should do, but let's check the stock. Now, solid cam, now that you define the coordinate system and forced it to have this X axis going down this long uh, length here, it quit trying to fit this diagonally into a box. So this is that's just another way to define your stock. I wanted to show you that. Okay. Why it does this, I don't know. It picked the solid, and then it won't let you accept it until you repick it. Still don't know that one. That's a bug. So repick your solid, and then again your target. And I think I'm going to move that coordinate system up. 
Oh, but I need to show the stock so I can see it. And then I have to reselect this solid. Thank you. Okay, let's redefine that coordinate system. Define, we'll put origin here, x direction here, y direction here, and flip it around x until my z is up. All right, that should be all happy. Okay, now we get to go into the operations. Now, the first thing, the first thing I want to tell you is, uh, let's see, should I hold off on that? Yeah, I'll hold off on that. All right, so let's go to add a milling operation. So you see. There's a whole bunch of different options. There's a contour 3D. Now what the contour 3D means is just pick an edge like the like like our profiles before. That's not what we want. We want kind of a whole surface operation. Um, HSS is is one of them. We don't really have an HSS. Did we verify that? I think it works on the other computer. Yeah, so they don't. There, there's a different. Uh, you, you, you have some different options based on your level. We have educational versions. I think you guys, actually, you guys, the, the trial version has all the good options. Because um, when I was grading your homeworks, it would pull up, and it my version is educational, so it had to convert from your version to my version. It worked, but. Um, anyway, in the educational version, they don't have HSS, which is a high-speed um, roughing type pattern. Um, so we're going to be using, for the educational version, we're going to be using these two, basically, high-speed roughing and high-speed machining. The machining is going to be kind of your finishing pass, and the roughing is your roughing pass. So that's what we're going to look at first. Um, let's. I'm going to just do the finishing for now because most, most of the time you're probably not going to use roughing for what you're going to be doing. Um, so there's high speed machining. You can see there's up in this corner there's a bunch of options and those will show you, I believe if you click them, yeah it shows you the pictures of what, what it intends to do. And I think what I wanted to show first was constant Z. So this kind of picture here. Okay. All right. Tool. Uh, well, first, let's see. Let's pick the geometry first. So right now, it's got the target, which was our entire model selected. This is one thing I didn't like about SolidCam is it's hard to select individual surfaces whereas in MasterCam it's much easier. So this this was kind of counterintuitive. I was thinking no I don't want you to machine out this entire thing but it thinks you do. It thinks you want to use a 3D surface to machine all this out. A 3D surfacing path is not efficient for these uh, uh, paths here. A drill is much more efficient to drill these holes. A flat end mill is much more efficient to take out uh, these pockets and to do this outer profile. But that's what it thinks you want to do right now so that's what we're going to go with and then what we're going to do is later we're going to restrict solid cam into this boundary. We're going to say okay you, th you want to machine the whole thing in a 3D surface we're going to restrict the boundary to this little square type feature here. And then it'll say, okay, I just want to machine that part of it. All right, so tool. We'll hit select. 
need to have a little discussion about tools. We need to use a ball end mill with this spherical tip. And the reason is so we've got this crazy cur curved surface and we want to cut it. Your flat end mill is not, I, I suppose it technically could cut it, but it's going it has a hard time, the software is going to have a hard time interpolating where this point is in relation to the point that your machining is. Whereas the ball, it can do that easier. So you need, and it also makes for uh, smoother surfaces as you're moving across. So you need to use ball end mills when you're 3D surfacing. Now that's not true. Solid cam, it's it's boast uh, in industry is that it can rough faster than other programs. So uh, its software is set up to help you make a step pattern very quickly on your 3D surface with your square end end mill and then you'll come back with your ball and take out what they call the rest material. So far it's got a more efficient um, way of doing this, a more efficient set of code to do this. So they expect you to use a flat when you're roughing and a ball when you finish. But for right now we're going to go with ball so make sure you have a ball. Um, we're going to stick with a quarter inch. You could go smaller or bigger. Uh, you're, you would go bigger when you have, so remember your length to diameter ratio. You, you get this too long and it cantilevers too much, you get tool deflection. We've had to use really big ones like one or one and a quarter inch ball end mills when students have come up when they've wanted to do fuselages on uh, UAVs. Um, that are like six foot wingspan and six, seven foot long fuselages that ended up, they would do it in two halves and the fuselage would be like eight to 10 inches in diameter. So they had to do cut four inches of foam in order to lay up uh, a carbon fiber or a, a fiberglass skin on the foam. So they needed four inches. You don't want to use a quarter inch end mill, it's four inches long. That's way too big of a length to diameter ratio. But in this case, this little clip, you saw it, I passed it around, it's pretty short. So I'm going to use a quarter inch end mill. Now your feeds, you can go really fast in most of, most of these instances, especially in foam, um, which we tend to cut a lot uh, for making molds uh, because it's just a weak material. You can cook through it quickly. In aluminum as well, though. So... I'll talk more about this later, but when you're surfacing these things, uh, you're taking very, very small step overs in order to get a smooth surface. So that first cut you make is going to be a pretty big cut because this is all a squarish material, but the rest of the cuts are going to be very, very small on the order of a thousandth or two of an inch at a time. So even in aluminum at a thousandth of an inch, you can cook through that. That's a small cut. So you can move pretty quickly. Um, on our machines, if you go past about 50 inches a minute, the motors have a hard time keeping up. So we stay at about 50. And the Z in this case doesn't really matter as much because you're, you're moving along the Z axis just as if you were moving along the X and Y axes. It's the same in this case. Unlike your 2D pass where you might be plunging into material, here we're just following the surface in X, Y, and Z. So you can keep the feeds the same. For a quarter inch end mill, we want to be cooking. And we might want some coolant. Okay. All right. Now we got to constrain the boundaries. So remember, Solid Cam said, oh, okay, you want to do the whole thing. I'll try and do the whole thing. We don't want to do the whole thing. We've already pr probably drilled the holes and machined out these pockets and maybe even done this outer outer profile. All we want to do is this face. So we need to constrain it. We're going to do it manually. So we'll let's see, we create manually. 
and I'm going to go ahead and select that boundary and I just want this square and I'll accept that thank you um, it doesn't like my gap minimums what does it want 0.04 I don't know why that changed okay so there's my boundary and then then we go into parameters alright so there's a ton of parameters that you can do and they'll all change based on the type that you picked so we just can't go into all of that here, but uh, this is one of your more common um, uh, tool paths. The, you, you'll recognize some of these, wall offset and floor offset, so that's walls and floors. And then, um, but, and then you'll, you'll recognize step down as well. That's how far this tool is going to step down before it goes to the next path. You can see what it's trying to do here. It's going to try and step down run across step down run across step down run across only we're going to do a whole bunch of those in very small increments in order to get this spherical surface um, it's kind of hard coded in our z bottom limits already um, now on our step down i could leave it at 25 thousandths of an inch but it, uh, in reality i'm probably going to make this very very small I'm probably going to be down in the one or two thousandths of an inch but I'll leave it at 25 for right now uh, maybe we'll go to 10 I also forgot to get those surface finish gauges they're in the measurements cabinet in a wood box about this big by this big it looks really old and you open it up and it's have you seen it before it's, they've got all different kinds of roughnesses. They're little steel blocks with different roughnesses. Okay. Let's go ahead and uh, calculate this. And then simulate it. You can see what it's going to start doing. So there's that ball end mill. You see how it's kind of stepping down and moving across? And this is what's meant by the constant Z path. It's on each pass, it's keeping constant in its Z plane as opposed to moving up and down like this, which it could do. So it's cooking along. Speed it up a little bit. So notice it didn't go all the way down. It didn't. It didn't really cut it all. We need to catch all of it. So if you go back to your constraint boundaries, this is under the tool, uh, the the boundary tool relation. So we have centered selected so if you look at if you look at the drop downs centered is centered off the tool all right so the little tip of the tool actually made it to this little boundary but that doesn't finish the part off so we want to select something else external will keep going on the boundary until it finishes that boundary internal will keep that tool until the edge of that tool that ball hits that boundary which won't finish it off but in some cases you want that if you're let's say you're inside a, a cavity and you don't want to have your tool blast past the wall you want you might want internal here we're gonna go external We'll recalculate <coughs> and we'll re-simulate.
and you see it makes it all the way down. I probably should have stopped it right there so you could see it. Yeah? Okay, now, um, one moment here. This is a student joke from about how many years ago? And they keep getting me. Every year I find something new. I'll make for a good little text message later. Turkeys. One night they broke in and wrapped up everything in the shop. Well, not everything. Choice things. And I keep finding them. It tells you how long it's been since I've used these. All right, I'm going to pass these around. So these are surface finish gauges. Okay, and uh, surface finish is given in a root mean square, uh, so it'll, it'll be an RMS value. So, let's see if I remember how to do this. So, if your surface is like this, it would be the root mean square of all the, let's see, of all the distances. On the, on the imperfections, right? So it's given an RMS values. I think it's on this chart. Let me make sure. Yeah. So you'll see on this chart, there's root mean square of 4, 8, 16, 32. And uh, that correlates with a uh, letter here. And then you can feel what, it, look and feel what it feels like. Okay? So the... I bring that up with 3D surfacing because these paths, since you don't have a flat end mill, it's not going to make this nice smooth path. Your, the smoothness is determined by how far you step over at a time. Okay? I'm going to pass these around and I'll tell you that your, if you step over by, let's say, two or three thousandths of an inch, you're going to be in the F range, which is in the well, maybe the E or F range, which is in, on the order of RMS like uh, 250, 125, something like that. Okay, so pass those around, take a look at them. And the reason is, so if you had material like this, and you had a ball end mill, and you cut right there, if you stepped over an entire radius of an end mill, or a, a diameter, let's say, okay? You're going to be left with this little area here. They call that a scallop, okay? So, as you can see, that scallop could be pretty tall if you stepped over an entire diameter of the tool, in this case a quarter inch. If you step over less, let's say a radius, your scallop gets less. And if you step over even less, they get even smaller. Okay? In most software packages, you can either define the height of the scallop that you want to get, or you can define your step over and that will then define your scallop. You want to probably get your scallops down to something that's not all that perceptible to feel. So I'm thinking maybe if it was more than a thousandth or two, it would feel really bumpy and rough. Okay? Because of that, you're going to have to step over by very, very small increments which means you're going to be running pass after pass after pass after pass. So these tool paths can get very long, lots of length of code, and lots of time. Okay, now the one benefit is you do get to move a lot quicker that 50 inches a minute when you're um, taking such small values, small step overs. But still, it's a, uh, it can be long, long paths. So there's that external. 
Um, let's see. I wanted to show. Yeah, so in your link, you can change uh, a few a few different things. You can climber conventional. You can go back and forth, back and forth, or you can just go one direction, come up, and come back over. One direction, come up. That'll take a lot longer. And back and forth, back and forth, in this case, probably isn't a bad thing. You'll have tool deflection. You don't want it to pull into your part by conventional milling. But remember, you're only cutting one or two thousandths of an inch. So that tool deflection is going to be very, very small. Um, let's see. Start. You can pick your start positions. So in this case, it was up here. You may want to pick down here. You may want to pick this side. You, you can pick which direction you're going to move. So there's a lot of different options in there. All right. Any questions there? I wanted to show that's if th th so this HSM, uh, either constant Z or one of the other ones, uh, is kind of a real quick and dirty. I just want to write a path and just knock it out. Uh, if you want a lot, so it limits your options here, limits the, 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 the danger you can get yourself into, but it also allows you to, uh, to write paths very quickly. The kind of the all in one that has all the options where you can pick just about everything on the, on the 3d surface, but then you can get yourself into trouble because you may not know what you're doing, uh, is this other path. So let's write this other path, and I might have to kill this path. So that's this 3D milling. All right, so again, it's got the, the target. Um, but in this case, we want to define a working area. So the target's this whole model. We want to define our working area. Um, do I have to name it? And then I'll define it. So I just want this boundary. Yes, accept it. It's not going to like that minimum gap. And then I can show it, and it shows it there. So that's all I'm working with. That's important. Um, again, you get this. Oops. Hey. Oh, I killed it. I have to do it again. I didn't accept it, so killed it. I need to set that in my solid cam options so that doesn't keep coming up. All right, so again, I want external because I want that tool, see the tool will continue to go until it finishes that boundary regardless of what the to, uh, how far the tool has to go off the material. If I had done internal, the tool will stay inside the boundaries. I don't know why that's not showing up. Um, you can select an offset value. You can say, hey, not only do I want to go past the boundary by just the tool extents, but I want to go a little bit more. Um, let's see. We could also have selected uh, drive faces and drive surfaces or drive faces are the the surfaces that are going to drive the tool path. So those are the surfaces you want to cut. 
So let's try that. I could say, hey, I want to cut that face. So instead of doing that boundary, I could have said, I want to cut that face. All right. Check faces or check surfaces. It's not really valid in this part, but a check surface or a check face is you're telling the tool, I don't want to go, I, I want to cut that drive surface, but I don't want to run into these surfaces. And that is more likely to happen inside a cavity than here. But you can say, okay, I don't want to hit that surface or that one or that one or that one. So I don't want to touch any of these things here. Don't hit any of those while you're doing this drive surface path. That's what a check surface is. And then here's that cut only the rest material. And that's where if you've done a roughing pass, it'll, it'll uh, be a lot more efficient. Okay, so there's your geometry in this 3D. Um, again, we're going to do a tool. I'll just keep this quarter inch. Um, again, you, the, this is familiar. You'll have your levels. Now, your safety distance, you might want to, uh, in this case, if remember, it's going to take hundreds, if not more, dozens, if not hundreds of passes, because they're really small passes. If you're going to pull up every time, to point one, point one, point one, you're wasting a lot of time in there. So you may want on these complex 3D paths, you want may want to make these way smaller just so that uh, you save time in there. You've got your levels, you know about those. Yeah, yeah. Charge up the, the old computer. Mmm, power. Okay. Here you can, unlike the other path, here you can select your roughing and finishing and all that jazz. So if we wanted to, we could we could start by roughing this out. Now, in this case, I don't think I would rough this thing. Because as you saw that path, if I'm only stepping down by a few thousandths of an inch, I'm just coming along a few thousandths at a time. I really don't think I need to rough it. Um, but there are times when you might want to rough. And you can put in, there are roughing ball end mills as well. So you can put in a roughing ball end mill and hog big chunks of this material out, leaving big scallops. And then you can go back with a finishing tool and take out the scallops. So you can select these roughing patterns and you can see what they're doing. You can do it in a hatch or a contour or a plunge. I'm going to go with a hatch, I think. Uh, surface offset. So here you're going to say, okay, leave a certain amount of material, maybe 20 thousandths. That's okay. Your step over. How far are we going to step over? So we'll take one rough pass. How far are we going to step over? This is a pretty big one, 0.2. Let's see what that does. So we'll save and calculate that and simulate that. So you see it's stepping over by 0.2 at a time. Big, big scallops here, big, big rough. Okay, and we're probably probably at break. Five minutes over. When is break supposed to be till? Oh, I keep going over. I keep thinking it's nine fifty-five. All right, well, come back at uh, ten fifteen.